So good afternoon, I'm Dr. Richardson. This is lecture five of a course using vector calculus to solve problems in electricity and magnetism. Uh, my email address is listed above. And again, uh, for administrative, administrative issues, um, please remember that learning is not a passive activity. You need to take notes during the course, just sitting back and watching me um, write on my whiteboard is not going to get it. You need, actually need to sit down and take an active role in writing out the lectures uh, at home or in the comfort of wherever you are. Problem sets. You need to work the problem sets yourselves, consulting uh, other colleagues or sources online or books, that's not going to help you understand how the material works. Just looking at the solution and copying the solution or reading the solution is not the way to go. Problem set four, uh, that was posted in the Google Drive late Tuesday night. The solution key to problem set four will be available on the Google Drive site, excuse me, uh, probably midday Monday morning midday monday problem set five should be available sometime tuesday and the video clip for this lecture lecture five should be available also all these items will be on the google drive you're encouraged to ask questions you have my email address i'm available um, and you can reach out to me um, during the weekend the weekends and i promise to respond to you within 24 hours if you have a question on a problem, either on a problem set or something we've gone through in a lecture. Um, and again, uh, I find it useful to go through uh, problems using a ruler, and I hope you will too. Okay, so let's start. So let's review where we were last time. We were looking at how to use vector operators. And I want to finish that discussion today. And then I want to start actually applying all the vector analysis and vector calculus and multivariable calculus that we've talked about so far to the problem at hand, namely looking at electrostatics. So we were talking about vector fields last lecture. And we were talking about using the divergence as an example of a vector field, let's say lowercase v. We know how to calculate this, certainly in uh, Cartesian coordinates. And in fact, um, you can also calculate the divergence both in cylindrical polar coordinates and spherical polar coordinates. And you'll see that on a problem set. So we were looking at an example of what a, does it mean to take a divergence of a vector field physically? So the particular example we were talking about was flowing water. So if you go to your local favorite park near a stream, you'll see water flowing. And it's clear if you just look at it, the leaves in the stream, that the water molecules in, that comprise the stream are all not moving at the same speed. So what we are going to do is view water, not realistically, but in a nice simple model. And again, we looked at this last time, as if the water molecules were moving in two dimensions characterized by a vector field. We also call this a velocity field. So what this means is that if you look at the XY plane, 
and you just pick out three water molecules. Each one of them is moving to the right with some velocity. In this case, the velocity has a norm of a half. Then if you move to the point x equals two and pick three other water molecules, they move at a different speed or velocity of one meter per second. Then if you look at three water molecules at x equals three, they're gonna be moving at a different rate or speed, three halves. So I've only picked nine molecules or particles in this fluid, but it's clear that it's a vector field because at each point I can assign a vector and these vectors are not necessarily the same. So in this picture, you have a stream of water moving to the right. You can calculate the divergence of this vector field. I showed you how to do that last time. In this case, it's simply a half. So it's a positive quantity. And what we want to do now is connect these two ideas. What does the fact mean? Is there any connection or anything clearly related to the fact that the divergence of the vector field is positive in this case and the velocity field for nine of the particles in the fluid looks as follows. So, let us draw in my velocity field an imaginary circle and study this velocity field. And what you see is that inside this circle, more particles leave the circle than enter it. So the velocity field gets less dense inside the circle. The velocity field becomes less dense inside my circle C. And as the circle gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so its radius goes to zero, what you have is a point in your velocity field, which is a source of particles. And all this comes about because you have a vector field whose divergence anywhere in the xy plane is positive. So for positive divergence of a vector field, any point in the field acts as a source of particles. What about another example of a velocity field? Again, this is a vector. So you give me a point x, y, I'll give you a vector v. And I'm gonna use again my model of a two-dimensional system of fluid flow. And I'm going to use a very similar velocity field to the previous example, but I'm just going to change it slightly by making this term negative. So clearly when I do that, the divergence of V in this case is minus a half, so it's negative. So the question is, how is that related to the picture of what's going on in two dimensions? So we're doing a problem in fluid dynamics, or fluid mechanics rather. Well, same story, x-axis, y-axis. Let's pick three arbitrary points 
And again, it's easy to show that all of the particles or molecules at each point in the fluid move to the left. But as you go to the right, the velocity vector become larger. So again, same story. Let's construct a search circle inside my velocity field. And physically just watching what happens to this system as time evolves, more particles enter the circle on the right then leave the circle on the left. So the velocity field becomes more dense. Inside the circle. So it's a very nice physical way to view what's going on. Let this circle essentially become small enough. So you're talking about what's happening at a point. And what you have at a point in the vector field or the velocity field is you have a sink of particles. And the divergence in this case is zero. So you have a mechanism where, if you will, particles can be drained from the system. Okay, finally, let's pick a intermediate case. We have a velocity field. And again, I'm using this model of a two-dimensional fluid. And I'm gonna make it even more simpler. It's going to be a number five times I hat. And so I can sketch that out. And what this velocity field will look like for my two dimensional fluid, at any point in the fluid, I'll have a vector velocity vector associated with it, but it'll be moving in the same direction and it will be constant. So for this particular choice, V, of a velocity field, all particles move at the same speed, at the same speed. And again, I'll use my same trick inside my two dimensional fluid. I'll have an imaginary circle, C. And what's going on physically is that the same number of particles enter the circle as leave. So if you let this circle get smaller and smaller, by letting its radius get smaller and smaller, you have a point and there's really no net change in the velocity of particles at that point. And if you go through the exercise, which in, in um, Cartesian coordinates is very easy of taking the divergence of the vector field V, as we talked about last time. That's just zero. So to summarize, if you have a vector field, let's say E, and it's positive, then the field at any point acts as a source of particles. If you take the divergence of a vector field 
in a problem, and it turns out that's negative, then the field at any point will act as a sink for, particle, for particles. And for the case where you take the divergence of a field, let's say E and it's zero, there's no net change at any point in the vector field. So two comments I wanna make. These discussions, these arguments, I essentially borrowed from Sal Khan and Khan Academy. So you should consult that for further information. And also you have lots of other examples, both in calculating and understanding physically what the divergence of a vector field means in problem set four. Again, that's available on the Google Drive and the solution key will be posted sometime Wednesday, next Wednesday. So there is a remaining vector field that we wanna talk about, or remaining vector operator that we need to discuss, sorry. And that is what is, what do we mean by taking the curl of a vector field. We know what the curl is, it's a vector operator. And we know what vector fields are. So the question is, we combine those two things, what's going on? Okay, so formally, quickest way to see this is to recognize that the vector operator A or the vector operator del is a vector. The vector V, the vector A rather, is a vector. And I know how to take the curl of two vectors by using this trick. It's not really correct mathematically, but it will work. First row, let's say I'm taking the curl of my vector field A in uh, Cartesian coordinates, and the first row would just be the unit vectors I hat, J hat, K hat. The second row would consist of the elements of the del operator in Cartesian coordinates. They are just respectively partial with respect to X, partial with respect to Y, partial with respect to Z. And the third and final row are just the uh, components of my vector field A, A sub X, A sub Y, A sub Z. So I know how to take this determinant in quotes and write it out. But before I do that, I wanna introduce some shorthand notation that people sometimes use that rather than writing out partial with respect to X, you can just say partial subscript X. Um, I don't really do that a lot in the problem set solutions, but I wanna do that here just to save some space. So the curl of the vector field A using the cyclic rule is just I hat partial of Y A sub Z and partial minus partial of Z A sub Y plus J hat times the partial with respect to Z of A sub X minus the partial with respect to X of A C Z. And the third and final term is just one that involves the unit vector K hat and using the cyclic rule, I have to have a partial with respect to X and A sub Y minus the reverse of that partial with respect to Y of A sub X. So again, the cyclic rule bails you out one, two, three, and here is two, three, one, and here is three, one, two. So that formally is how you would calculate the curl of a vector field in Cartesian coordinates. It's a pretty straightforward exercise to do. I will leave this to you to 
experiment with in problem set five, which will be available Google Drive on Monday. I will also show you how to give you some problems where you should play around with the idea of calculating how to take the curl of a vector field, not just in Cartesian coordinates, but in cylindrical polar coordinates, as well as spherical polar coordinates. So that's a challenging task, but it's something everybody should do at least once in their career. Um, what we will also see in problem set five are lots of physical examples of what it means to take the curl of a vector field. So I would like to go do an example. And again, I'm gonna go back to my case in two dimensions of looking at water flow. So this is an example from fluid dynamics. So it's a model, it's an ideal model. I'm not saying that it's correctly describes what's going on, but it's gonna be simple enough for us to deal with. And the math we need is gonna be reasonable. And if you really wanna see how this works, I'll go talk to a friendly mechanical engineer or take a course in fluid dynamics. Okay, so my two-dimensional system, this example I'm gonna look at will be water flow water is flowing in circular paths. Um, and this is analogous to water draining from a bathtub. As long as you don't take this model too seriously. So what's the model? We'll draw a circle here. And at this point here, I'm going to have a volume, small volume. Of water. And it's going to be moving over the circular path. So I want to describe how it moves. Well, there'll be a position vector x, and there will be an angle, which will be equal to omega t. So I need to define some terms. So omega is the angular velocity of that small volume of water. It has units of radians per second. T is obviously time. R is just the radius of the circle. So the X position and the Y position of that small volume of water can, see, can simply be expressed as R cosine omega T and R cosine omega t respectively. Note that omega t, it's a radians over second times a second, so that's the dimension is quantity, that's an angle. Angles are in radians, they're dimensionless, so arguments of trigonometric functions should be dimensionless. And I have a length both on the right and the left hand side, so everything's fine. And I should mention that this is not the only thing that can happen in this two-dimensional model. I can have water flowing in another circular path where the radius is different. Let's say the angular velocity is the same, but the radius is going to be different. So what do we want to know? We want to know what is the velocity field. of water in this problem. It's very similar to the three previous examples where we looked at uh, the divergence of velocity fields. So that's a question. So you know how to do this, right? Velocity is just the derivative of a position vector. 
And in two dimensions, that's just i hat dx dt plus j hat dy dt. So that's formally what the velocity field of water should look like in this two dimensional model. I have the information that will allow me to calculate these total derivatives because I know what x and y are in their time dependence. So I'm good to go. So I'll keep my figure for a moment. And I can simply write down a simple expression for the velocity of field in this problem. And you should prove this to yourself that this is true. It's omega, the angular frequency, which is a constant, times i hat y plus j hat x. Whether or not the angular frequency is a constant or not, you know, that's just the model we're going to pick to make our lives easier. So the curl of this velocity field, we can now calculate, at least in Cartesian coordinates. It's just two omega k hat. So two things to notice. For this example, this vector field has a curl that's not zero. So let me need this because I don't need that anymore. Second observation is that because the curl of, well, the curl of this vector field is not zero. That's what the mathematics tells us. If you look at this actual figure, what the figure tells you is that the water or velocity field has rotation. So back in the day, people used to call the curl ROT, ROT, which was just a, an abbreviation for rotation. So something that has a non-zero curl or vector field that has a non-zero curl is a, is a vector field that has rotation in it. And another thing that's interesting, you know, we might as well milk all we can out of this, the curl is a vector, remember? Del is a vector, uh, V is a vector. When you take the curl of a vector, you must get a vector. So the curl of the vector, V in this example, points out in the positive k hat direction. So again, I didn't put these in explicitly, I should have, but I said that we were doing this problem in the xy plane the curl points out, it's a vector that points out towards you using the right hand rule. And the water flow flows in a counterclockwise direction. If you picked a vector field that rotated or flowed in the clockwise direction, it's easy to show that its curl would be in the minus j, minus k hat direction into the plane of the whiteboard. So whether or not a vector field has a zero or non-zero curl tells you something about the degree which the vector field has, has some type of rotation associated with it. And a simple example of two-dimensional fluid flow is an easy way to see what's going on here. We are going to look at many more examples of this with lots of more nice pictures for you to practice and see what's going on in problem set five. But I just thought that since we were talking about fluid mechanics in two dimensions in a simple idealized model, that um, we might as well look at the curl of this particular vector field. Okay, so we have reached a major point in this course where we have concluded at least for now, 
all the vector analysis, all the discussion of uh, coordinate systems, and all the vector calculus we will need. And if we need more, we'll introduce it. Also, all the multivariable calculus we need. And if we need more, we'll talk about it. At some point in time, we'll have to talk about Taylor series, and we'll do that either in lecture or in a problem set. So let's start talking about a problem in real life electrostatics. So suppose you have a, a point charge Q and a point charge Q prime. They could be electrons, they could be uh, protons would have charge, they could be neutrons. Well, neutrons don't have any charge, so they couldn't be neutrons. And let's say these two point charges, so there's some physical source for these point charges. Let's say if you want, you're comfortable with electrons, say they're electrons. So let's say these two point charges are separated by a distance r. So the unprimed notation I'm going to refer to as the source charge, and q prime I'm going to refer to as the test charge. So Coulomb was a great experimentalist, and he was the first one to recognize that there is something going on in this system that can be expressed in an experimental law. Now, this topic is electrostatics. And so that's important to understand. These charges are not moving. If you want these charges to move, that's another problem. But let's do one thing at a time. So what Coulomb discovered was that between these two charges, Q and Q prime, there's a force. That force is a vector field. So I can use all the machinery that we've talked about here too for in electrostatics. That force, first of all, has a proportionality constant of one over four pi epsilon naught. Epsilon naught looks like a very strange constant. It has a name. It is called the permittivity of free space. Excuse me. And I will simply mention that in empty space, it has, excuse me, a value. And the reason why we make this distinction is that Coulomb discovered that his law also applies in cases where you don't have a vacuum, like glass or water or fluid or benzene. Well, this force is going to be proportional to the product of these two charges. It's going to go like one over the uh, square of the separation between those two charges. And that force is going to be a vector that points in the radial direction between those two charges, Q and Q prime. So I can't derive Coulomb's law. I'm not smart enough. And I don't believe it can be derived. But I'll leave that for experts, which I'm not one. But let's just assume that Coulomb's, Coulomb's law works. After all, it's an experimentally empirical, empirically observed law. Let's see what this law tells us. So it's going to tell us a couple of things. First of all, let's rewrite it. So we'll write it up here. So the force between my charge Q, my source charge Q, and my test charge Q is going to be a force that goes like one over the square of the distance that separates those two charges. That force is going to be in a radial direction. And there will be a proportionality constant that I will always have to worry about of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is a permittivity of free space. So a couple of things. If, in fact, the product of Q and Q prime is positive, so charge comes into two types, positive and negative. Okay. So if the charges are similar, if they're both positive or they're both negative, and if you look at 
the charge Q prime, there's going to be a force on it. And that force is going to be proportional to the direction of the uh, radial unit factor. And so that says that that charge is going to see a force that's repulsive. So Q prime is going to see a repulsive force. Very easy to show that charge Q is going to see a force that's proportional to minus the direction of R hat. And that's also going to imply that Q is going to see a repulsive force. So like charges will repel. Perhaps Benjamin Franklin was the first one to, in conjunction with Coulomb, to grasp this. So like charges repel. And if you have charge Q and Q prime and they're not the same, then their product is negative. And it's easy to show that Q prime will have a force in the minus I, heart, I hat direction. So it will be attractive. And similarly, Q will see a force that's attractive. And you should go through the simple vector arguments to prove this to yourself. So this simply says that unlike charges physically will attract, be attracted to each other. Okay. So that's the first key thing that Coulomb's law is going to tell you. The second interesting thing that Coulomb's law is going to tell you, and I stated it, so I'll repeat it again, the force between these two charges is radial. Points along a vector, namely it points along the direction of the unit radial vector, r hat. Third thing that Coulomb's law tells you is that the force between these two point charges goes like one over the square of the separation of the two. And that's important. Does it go like one over r? It doesn't go like one over R Q. The experimental data say that the force goes like one over V separation distance squared. Now, there's a fourth observation that Coulomb made. And sometimes people just write it down and say, well, that's clear. And it's not, or obvious, that's probably a better word. And it's the principle of superposition. And it turns out that there's no theoretical reason why as far as I understand, this principle is, should be true. It's just say an experimental fact. So what am I talking about? So here's a charge Q. This is my source charge. And here, let me have a test charge Q sub one. So there is a force on Q due to the point charge Q sub one. The principle of superposition says, if I introduce to this system a second test charge Q sub two, it's not going to affect any, in any way, shape or form, how Q one acts on Q. So this is going to be a completely separate creature. So the force due to the test charge Q sub two can be described by a separate vector F sub two. And the principle of superposition says that the total force on Q, the source charge Q, is just gonna be derived by calculating the force on Q from Q one, and then separately calculating the force on the a source charge Q due to Q two, and adding those two vectors up. And in principle, this is far more powerful because instead of having two source charges, you can imagine having N source charges. And all you have to do 
is go through the exercise of calculating the force on the source due to one external test charge, one at a time. Just do this vector sum, or do this sum. That's a vector sum, and get a final result. So, the principle of superposition we're going to use momentarily. Um, and those are really the four physical key ideas that you can get from Coulomb's law. So in some ways, that's everything to electrostatics, but that's like saying to a mechanical engineer that F equals MA is all there is to mechanical engineering. So there's a lot more that you can coax out of Coulomb's law. So again, let's go back to Coulomb's law. Suppose I have a charge, source charge Q, and a test charge Q prime. And they're separated by a distance R. Then I know that Q prime experiences a force when I put a distance R from Q. Now let me do the following. Let's do the following experiment. Let me remove Q prime. So there's just a hole there. The question is, what's there? Well, I can answer that formally. All I'm doing is taking Coulomb's law and dividing out the test charge. And what I'll get is a new vector field, which I'll call the electric field. The electric field for a point charge is this Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, R squared. And I have to have my unit vector R hat because after all the electric field is a vector, so the thing on the right-hand side had better be a vector. This quantity, E, is something we'll call the electric field. It is a vector field, so all the properties of vector fields apply to it. Turns out that this thing has energy. Electric fields have energy, and they have momentum. So they are real things. Namely, if you put back into the system your test charge Q prime, it'll feel a force due to something. And that something is always there, whether the test charge is there or not. That something is this fellow, the electric field. Okay. Um, so in a sense, we are going to spend the next three lectures calculating electric fields. And there are two cases that we have to consider. One case is where the source charge is just a set of discrete point charges. And the other case is when the source charge is a continuous charge distribution. So the former is pretty straightforward, and you'll have some examples of practicing this in problem set five. Um, the latter is a little bit more involved, and so we'll talk about that now. Um, one last thing before we start looking at an actual problem. The electric field is a vector field. And so that means that it depends upon a vector, in this case in Cartesian coordinates is R. That means it depends upon three coordinates, X, Y, Z. But it also means that it's a vector, so it has components. One in the i hat direction, e sub x. But this component depends upon x, y, z. So be careful. j hat times e, y component. But she depends upon x, y, z. So be careful. Plus k hat times a z component. But that is a scalar function. 
these guys are scalar fields. So the components of the electric field are not constants, they are scalar fields. But again, this thing on the left-hand side is a vector and the sum of these three objects on the right-hand side is a vector. Okay, so let's look at an example. So the first example we're going to do, let me just draw it first and then I'll discuss it in a minute. So I'm going to draw an isosceles triangle. It means the two of its sides are equivalent, though this figure may not be drawn to scale. And here I'm going to use a coordinate system. It's a little different. So I hat points to the right, J hat, uh, K hat rather points upwards. So I'm gonna place a point charge Q1 over there, point charge Q2 over there. Q2, Q1 is gonna be separated from the origin by a distance D over two, and Q2 is gonna be separated from the origin by a distance D over two. This distance from Z to this point, P, I'm gonna call Z, and the hypotenuse of this right triangle is going to be R. So here's the question I want to ask. What is the electric field in this system at point P, where P is just 0, 0, X? That's the question we want to ask. So let me outline how we're going to solve this problem. We are going to use the principle of superposition. As we discussed, the principle of superposition applies to Coulomb's law, so therefore it must apply to the electric field. So we're going to calculate the electric field due to the charge Q1. Then we're going to calculate the electric field due to the charge Q2 and add the two up. Okay, now I'm going to introduce the following observation. It may not be too clear as to why I'm doing this now, but it will in subsequent problems. The position vector R, after all, is just a unit vector times the norm of that vector. So that means that E1, the electric field due to point charge 1, is Q1, is just Q1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And since r hat is the vector r, the position vector divided by r, then this now becomes r in the numerator, but you have to pay a price for that. You put in an r cubed in the denominator. The next thing you have to do, so I know this already, um, I can probably put this, make this note up here, get this out of the way. Any vector has magnitude and direction. So that's what that says. Now, if I'm going to make further progress, I need to know what this position vector is. R. Well, for Q1, it is I hat X plus J hat Y plus K hat Z. Okay, so then just the general form for a position vector. Okay. What's R? Well, Pythagorean theorem tells me that R is just C squared plus D squared over four, all that to the one half power. So my denominator is going to be Z squared plus D to the fourth, D to the D squared over four, 
raised to the 3 halves power. OK, so again, this position vector in this problem in general looks like that for Q1. And note that I've gone to the trouble of writing it out in three dimensions, but that's actually a little bit too much work. Because in this problem, y is 0. So I'm working the plane. So the problem is a little simpler to evaluate. So I will keep my figure. And just begin where I left off. Namely, E sub 1, the electric field due to Q sub 1, is going to be electric field due to Q sub 1. It's going to be Q sub 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed i hat x, there's no y component, plus k hat z. And I know what r is. So this thing is just Q1 over 4 pi epsilon naught z squared plus d squared over 4. That entire quantity is raised to the 3 halves power. And in my numerator, I have an i hat x plus k hat z. And this is the electric field due to the point Q1. So I'm going to leave it up to you to show, in fact, Q2 has a similar expression, but there's a minus sign associated with this unit vector in the numerator. So that's minus k hat, sorry. Minus k hat z. And again, in the denominator is z squared plus d squared over 4. This entire quantity is raised to the 3 halves power. And this is a plus sign. This minus sign comes out because when you try to write down the position vector over here for Q2, the position vector is resolved into a component and its x component is in the minus i hat direction. So you really are finished. You need to recognize, to make our life simple, that in this problem, both these charges are identical. So Q1 and Q2 equal Q. And you can add these two things up using the principle of superposition. And what you'll find for this problem is that the electric field for those two charges is simply Q2 K hat Z divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. And this whole thing is multiplied by 1 over z squared plus well, quantity z squared plus d to squared over 4, all that to the 3 halves power. And again, recognize d is a constant. And z really is a variable. I mean, you can now find the electric field at any point in the i hat direction. So if you get a complicated expression in any problem, as we talked about many times in this course, you should look at limiting cases. So in fact, what happens in the limit that z is much, much greater than d? Well, one of the things you can do is take this expression, z squared plus d squared over 4 to the 3 halves. You can factor out a z squared, then you take its square root, then you cube it. So you'll get z cubed 
times one plus d squared over four z squared to the three halves power. And clearly when z is much, much greater than d, this term vanishes. So what you'll get is an expression that simply says that the electric field is going to be two times k hat z q over four pi epsilon naught z squared. Now if you think about this expression, it's telling you something very important. If you write it in the following form. This is a uh, cubed, sorry. The reason why I know it's cubed is by just linking it to dimensions. Okay, so charge Q has units of coulombs. Z has units of length, so Z squared has units of meters squared. Everybody else is dimensionless. K hat is dimensionless for pi epsilon naught um, well, epsilon naught is not dimensionless, but it's going to be in units that will allow you to uh, evaluate an electric field. The key thing here is the electric field is going to go like one over a distance squared, which it does. As you go further and further away from this system, it looks like a single point charge of value T to Q. Okay. So this limiting case does make sense. So always try to check your results by going through simple limiting cases. Okay, another example. So let me draw my example first and I'll describe it in a minute. So here I'm gonna have a infinite wire. This wire will have no width, okay? This wire will be along the x-axis. And this wire will have what's called a linear charge density associated with it. So linear charge density is gonna have units of charge per length, coulombs per meter. Okay. So the problem at hand here is I don't have a discrete point charge or number of discrete point charges. Here I have a wire with no width, it's its, uh, its length is infinite, goes from minus infinity to positive infinity, and it's broken down to small pieces of charge dq. And what I wanna do in this problem is find out what the electric field is, not just due to dq, but all over the wire. So let me introduce again some facts. I'll call this position vector R. This distance is Z. I'll put an angle theta here, which may or may not be useful. And here's X, and here's my right triangle. So what, the question I wanna ask is, what is the electric field due to my infinite wire, which has no width of linear charge density lambda at the point P, where P is zero, zero, X. That's the question I wanna ask. Okay, so I'm in a position to set it up. Sit back and think about what you're doing physically. The 
different, the small piece of charge dq will cause you to have an electric field at p. But that's not good enough. That doesn't solve the entire problem. You have to add up the dq over the entire wire. So you have to do an integral if you want to get the electric field. You have to do an integral of dE, which is a vector, over the entire wire. dE is just going to be dQ using the definition of the electric field divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the unit vector r hat divided by r squared. And there's one other thing I can do here to make my life a little simple or simpler. DQ is just going to be lambda times DL. So I've introduced a term. I need to define it. DL is just going to be a differential line element in this problem. That is all. That is to say, I'm just breaking the infinite wire into small pieces of length DL. Okay, so this is the creature I need to evaluate, this integral over the wire. Integrals can be complicated, so the idea is to start to simplify them. Lambda, the linear charge density, is a constant. Uh, the permittivity of free space is a constant. So they come out of the integral, and I'm just left with that. So I have three guys to worry about. DL, the unit vector R hat, and R. And so now let's systematically figure out what those things are in this problem. And in fact, I probably do not well, I'll leave the figure here for the moment. Okay, so first things first. So the electric field, due to this infinite wire, which has no thickness, but it just has a linear charge density of lambda, is just going to be lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught times dl r hat over r cubed. Well, dl is just a differential line element, and the wire is in the direct, is in the, uh, lies along the x-axis. So dl is just really dx. R, using trigonometry, is just x squared plus z squared all to the one-half power. Um, sorry, this is two. It's an inverse square line. Now, I'm going to go back to this trick that I used before. Let me clear this up a bit and make some more space. The electric field is going to be a constant times the integral over dx over r squared r hat, but the problem is that r hat is not a constant. It's not a vector that is independent of angles. Okay, i hat, j hat, and k hat are, but r hat is not. So it's a mistake to pull r hat outside of the integral. Can't do that. 
So this is not a vector that is independent. Or there's a better way to say this. This is not a vector, this is not a unit vector that is constant. So the trick we're gonna use is we're gonna turn it into a unit vector that we're gonna turn into a vector that depends upon unit vectors that are constants. And then the price we have to pay is we have a, the norm of the vector cubed in the denominator. So I maintain we've solved one of three problems. We know what DL is. We know what the differential line element is. We now have to figure out what R is. And we act the, the position vector R. And we've actually solved two out of three problems. We already know what R is. So that. Okay. So. My electric field is going to be what I get when I evaluate that integral. R in this problem is a position vector that's generated by taking minus i hat times x plus z in the k hat direction. So if you just look at this vector, points in that direction, this is how you break this up into its x and z components. So I'm good to go. I know what the differential line element is, dx. dl is dx. I know what the position vector is in this problem, the distance between dq and the point at which I want to evaluate the electric field. She is just the square root of x squared plus z squared to the one half power. And I know what the position vector is. It is a vector given by these two components. And the key thing is that x and z are now constants. These are constant unit vectors, so they can come outside of the integral. So what am I saying? Same exactly this, that e, again, which is a constant, is going to be dx. In the numerator, I have minus i hat x plus k hat z. And the denominator, remember, is r cubed. So I have to have in the denominator z squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power. So I have two integrals that I have to evaluate. The first one is going to have a minus sign. It's an integral over x. So it's really x dx of x squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. And the second integral, and there's an i hat here, vectors equal vectors. And then the second integral, again, is going to have a constant, the linear charge density over 4 pi epsilon naught times k hat. Again, these unit vectors, i hat, j hat, k hat, are constants. They can come outside of the integral. That's why we did this trick. And now I'm just integrating over z dx of x squared plus z squared to the 3 half power. So this problem now has reduced to a problem of calculus. All of the physics, if you will, all the electrostatics is over. I just now how to figure out how to do this integral. So a couple of things. Remember, z is a constant in this problem. I pick my point p 
along that axis. So here's P, here's X. P depends upon zero, zero, Z, and Z is a constant. X is a variable in this problem. So in fact, I'm now in a position to actually put down limits of integration for this problem. I want to integrate over the wire. The wire is, has infinite length, so it goes from minus infinity, x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And so my problem now is simply one of elementary calculus. We have done, excuse me, you have done these problems, these integrals in problem set two. So there's a reason why we spent a lot of time in problem set two reviewing elementary integrals. Because now when we get to a discussion of electrostatics of using them, we don't have to review the calculus. We know how to do it. Okay? And again, that's k hat. So the difference between these two integrals, this first one, x is a variable, this, and so x is in the numerator. The second one, be very careful, z is a constant, so it comes outside. And I just have dx in the numerator. The denominators are the same for both. So I am not going to, in lecture, evaluate these integrals. I gave that to you as a problem set exercise. So I'll tell you the answer. It's lambda times k hat over two pi epsilon naught z. And again, look at your limiting case. As you go far away from the wire, which has zero thickness, I know it's not a real system, but it's a model. So, so just be patient. I mean, you could make the model more complicated, have an actual wire of, of a uh, cylinder of a certain radius, but that's more complicated. So as Z, and it doesn't solve our purposes at the moment. So as Z goes to infinity, you would expect the electric field to vanish. Okay. So I have one more question for folks who are awake. Didn't I say the electric field went like one over a distance squared? So did I make a mistake? I have a Z in the denominator. And the answer is no, I actually did not. Lambda is a linear charge density that has units of coulombs for length. And Z is a distance. It has students, student units of length. So my electric field is going to go like, uh, it's going to be proportional to one over um, a length squared. Okay. Okay. So there's one remaining problem that I want to talk about. And that's the problem of a circular loop. So again, let me write the problem down first. And then I'll talk about what it is I want to find in a minute. So I'm going to do this in Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z. And I'm going to have a loop of radius a. So what my loop is, it's a finite wire. that's bent into a circle of radius A. And on this finite wire, it's not going to have, it's going to have finite length, but it's not going to have any uh, width to it. And it's going to be charged. And it's going to have a linear charge density of lambda. And the problem I want to solve here is I want to know what is the electric field 
at this point P. Where again, I can do some trigonometry while I'm at it. This distance is Z. This is obviously A. And here I have, I'll do this in red. So here I have a small piece of charge, DQ. So I have a problem that I don't have a finite a point charge. I don't have endpoint charges. I have a continuous distribution of charge, namely spread out over a circular loop. And the distance between DQ and my point P is R. So find the electric field at the point P due to the fact that I have a circular loop of linear charge density lambda and it has a radius, the loop has radius A. Okay, so let's get started. Same procedure. The electric field is going to be obtained by adding up the electric field, not just to this small piece of charge dq, but I have to add up those contributions over the entire loop. I have to integrate. So this is going to be an integration over the loop, as opposed to the previous case where I did integration over the wire. What is this? This is 4 pi epsilon naught times the integral of dq r hat over r squared. Same story. R hat, I cannot pull out of the integral. It depends upon an angle. The radial unit vectors depend upon angles. So to get around that impasse, I'll recast my expression in terms of a position vector, but I have to pay a price. The numerator, the denominator becomes R cubed. So, let's march forward. What do I need to know? To do that integral, I'm going to need to know three things. First thing I'm going to need to know is what is dq? Same story. It is lambda the linear charge density times some differential line element. So that's the first thing I'm going to need to know. Well, here's where I recognize that I have a problem that has cylindrical symmetry. Namely, if I look at this loop, it lies just in the xy plane. So in our discussion of plane polar coordinates, this angle is d phi. The radius of the circle is a. So this differential uh, arc element is just a d phi. So I know what dq is. A d phi is the same thing as dl. So dl is not along a straight line as it was for the wire. It's part of the circumference of this circle that comprises the loop. So dq is lambda times a d phi. It would be crazy to do this problem in Cartesian coordinates. So one down, two to go. So I know what dq is. Remember, I'm trying to evaluate an integral. So I'm trying to take everything inside this integral and write it into something that's simple. So, so far I've succeeded in turning it into something in the numerator that goes like dq lambda a, those guys are constants. Lambda is a constant, it's a linear charge density. A is the radius of the loop in this problem, that's constant. D phi is a variable. So I know I'm going to have to integrate over an azimuthal angle. So I'm, I'm sort of happy with that. 
The next guy I have to evaluate is the position vector r, but that's not too bad, right? Because that's just a squared plus z squared to the one half power. Pythagoras tells me how to deal with that. Okay. So the final term I have to do is figure out what r cubed is. Well, I have it, right? I know what r is. It's just the square root of a squared plus z squared. r cubed is just that to the third power. So let's put all this together. So the electric field is going to look like Lambda over four pi epsilon naught. Let's write everything over again. So we'll start from the beginning. DQ over R hat, DQ times R hat, R squared. This is really a constant, four pi epsilon naught. DQ R over R cubed. And again, I'm iterating it over the loop summing over all contributions due to the loop. This is going to be equal to lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught a d phi. I know what the magnitude of r is. It's just c squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. So the remaining thing I have to do in this problem is figure out what is r. What's the position vector? So go back to my picture. Here's my circular loop. I'm doing this problem in plane polar coordinates. So from plane polar coordinates, or sorry, I'm doing this problem in cylindrical polar coordinates. So R, again, points in that direction. She's just minus rho plus z. And again, all this follows from our discussion of cylindrical polar coordinates back in lecture two. So I can write this out. The minus sign follows from the direction of r. That vector goes in that direction. So when you write down the component in that rho hat direction, you need a minus sign. So this is going to become minus I hat rho, rho is just the radius of the circle, that's just A cosine phi plus J hat A sine phi, and now I need just Z, and that's K hat Z. And note, R depends upon I hat, J hat, K hat, those are all constant unit vectors. They're independent of the angle. You can pull them outside of the integral. So we're almost finished, at least formally. Our problem reduces to evaluating four integrals, three integrals. First one is e sub 1, lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught, there's a minus sign, i hat comes outside, and I have a a squared cosine phi d phi over z squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. The second component to the electric field is going to be a minus lambda j hat, four pi epsilon naught. I will have an a squared sine of theta d phi. The denominator is still the same. 
And my last and final integral is going to look like plus lambda k hat over 4 pi epsilon naught. And there is no a there in the numerator. This is just a z. Sorry, there is an a. A, this is 1a, not the square of an a. d phi. But the denominator is still the same. Now, these integrals may look fearful, but they are not. If you recognize that the radius of the circle or the loop is a constant, that's one thing. And you also need to recognize that z is, in fact, fixed in this problem. I wanted to calculate the electric field at that particular point, p. So that means that z is fixed. So essentially, this first integral goes like the following. a squared, a is a constant, and z is fixed. So the only thing you're really doing is integrating over the cosine of theta. And now it's time to put the limits of integration in. You're going from 0 to 2 pi. Second integral, same story. There's a proportionality constant. I'm not worried about it. But the bottom line is because a and z are constants in this problem. So I'm left with the integral over the azimuthal variable, azimuthal angle, phi. And the third and final integral I have to do, again, z and a are fixed. They're constants. So I just have to do an integral over v from 0 to 2 pi. And these integrals are actually pretty straightforward to do. First one vanishes. Second one vanishes. And the third and final one does not. So I leave it to you to calculate what this proportionality constant is. And I'll just tell you the answer. So when everything is said and done, the electric field in principle has two contributions, one in the i hat direction, one in the j hat direction, and one in the k hat direction. The only one that counts is the one in the k hat direction. And so it is lambda over 2 epsilon naught z a k hat over z squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. Again, um, this problem makes sense. The linear charge density goes like coulombs per meters. Z and A both go like a meter squared. And the denominator, I have a z squared, I take a square root. I have a quantity squared, length, I take a square root. I just get the length and then I cube it. So at the end of the day, I'm going to get something that goes like a charge over a length squared, which is the expected format for Coulomb's law. Limiting cases. I'm going to leave you the assignment of seeing what happens. You want to test to see if this problem makes sense, or if this answer makes sense. Two things you can test. See what happens if z is much, much larger than the radius of the loop, and see what happens when the radius of the loop goes to zero. Okay? So you need to go through those limiting cases to make sure that you get something that agrees with what we already know. I'll give you a hint. It's going to agree with what you should expect for the case of an isolated single point charge. Now, some of you may ask, isn't there an easier way to do this problem? And the answer is yes. Because if you go back and look at the problem, you would recognize as its symmetry would tell you that there's no contribution to this problem 
for the electric field for along the in the for the x component and for the y component so there's no reason to actually go and do uh the electric field sub one and the electric field sub two what we call those two integrals we did this just because we were just doing this by brute force but again symmetry would give you an easy way to do this so let me just summarize this problem when everything was said and done we started out with an integral that had this form And we had to make three substitutions, actually four, or three. DL, we had to recognize, was the differential line element. And it looked like A D phi. We had to recognize what the magnitude of R was. It's just Z squared plus A squared to the one half power. And since we were doing this problem in cylindrical polar coordinates, we needed to write down exactly what the position vector was in cylindrical polar coordinates. And in this particular case, it's I hat A cosine phi minus J hat A sine phi plus I hat plus K hat Z. Constants in this problem Clearly, the radius of the loop is a constant. And you are evaluating electric field at a fixed value of z. So that is effectively a constant. And even though this integral looks complicated, it's really not because there's only one variable, the azimuthal angle phi. That's the only thing that varies in this problem. So of these three problems, uh, two single isolated point charges, a infinite wire of zero thickness but linear charge density lambda, and a finite wire of no thickness bent into a loop or circular loop of radius A. This third is the most challenging and difficult problem. But always recognize where the physics is in play. And that's all really all in front of you here. And this really comes from the diagram. All this really comes from the picture. So pictures are important. And the picture tells you as you have, you have to solve this problem in cylindrical polar coordinates. Okay. It'd be foolish to try to do it in any other coordinate system. Okay, so next time we'll look at other examples of calculations involving uh, electric fields for continuous point distributions, or sorry, continuous charge distributions, where symmetry is gonna to come to your rescue, either cylindrical polar coordinates or plane polar coordinates or spherical polar coordinates. So there's a reason why we spent all that time studying those various systems. Uh, that was in uh, problem set three, it's worked out. And there's also a reason why we spend a lot of time reviewing integration in problem set two. So when we start going through these examples in lecture, um, we can save some time by not doing the actual calculus in lecture. I have no problems with doing it offline in a discussion or email or something like that. But in lecture, these, uh, these particular integrals you have seen before. So all you have to do is evaluate them for the appropriate limits of integration. Okay, so that concludes today's lecture. So next week will be lecture six, and we'll be looking at more examples of calculating electric fields for uh, continuous charge distributions. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? So now we have a... Um, time frame for about 30 minutes or so. Uh, well, we actually have 30 minutes to an hour where people can ask questions. And I'm willing to entertain questions on anything at this point. Problem set one, problem set two, problem set three, 
uh, even problem set four, though the solution key is not available yet, as well as lectures one, two, three, four. So I'm available from now to at least five o'clock. So questions from the audience? Can people hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Okay, so any questions or comments? Um, I don't have questions yet. Okay, but again, if you have a question, please send me an email, try to detail, email message, detail the question, and I'll promise I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. All right. And again, and again, as a reminder, problem set for the solution key, I'll post in Google Drive on Monday. Problem set five will probably be available Tuesday. And this video clip for lecture five should, my understanding is it should be available on Google Drive next Tuesday. Are people having any issues with accessing the material in the Google Drive? No. Okay. No, I don't think so. Okay. So again, please feel free to ask questions by email. It doesn't have to be on Monday or Wednesday. You can send me a question anytime, seven days a week, and I'll, I'll get back to you on it. Okay. Again, review the lectures, look at the video clips, do the problem sets. The only way that you, and again, it doesn't make any sense to jump into problem set four unless you've mastered the pre preceding three problem sets. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Have a good weekend. You too. You bye -bye. too. Thank you. Bye. Bye now.